In any human disaster, finding out who died and how they died is the overriding public concern. But seven years on, the public does not have a full account of the terrible human cost of this ongoing Iraq war to the Iraqi people. What we have instead is an incomplete patchwork of stories, pictures and data gathered by different organisations for different purposes, often published one day and forgotten the next. The victims of this war, their families and the publics whose taxes funded this war deserve better than this. There is a public right to know. Iraq Body Count has been working on a daily basis since March 2003 to ensure that no fact about a civilian death that is uncovered is then lost from view. We carefully monitor, compare and analyse published reports, mostly provided by press and media organisations, such as are represented in this room. In this way, we have been able to build and keep in the public eye the most detailed and comprehensive list of civilian deaths to date that exists. In fact, the world's press and media have, by default, been the frontline data gatherers of this war. Without journalists and without the organisations for which they work, the world would know little of substance about the Iraq death toll. But yesterday's release reveals that there has been another frontline data gatherer, the US Army. Day by day, secretly, soldiers all over Iraq have been writing detailed reports of the violent deaths they cause, witness, or are informed about. Dates, times, precise locations, names, ages, and occupations of victims have all been stored away in these logs. It is very good that this data has been collected, but it is wrong and unjustifiable that it has been kept secret for so long. Iraq Body Count has started the huge task of integrating the new information into the existing patchwork, just as we would for any other source brought to our attention. In the few weeks since we've had access to the logs, we've only scratched the surface. But by careful sampling and matching of these logs against what is already in our database, we have a clear emerging picture of what these logs contain as a whole. And the reports on our website, iraqbodycount.org, give the full details. But let me take you through the headline findings. I and my colleagues, Hamid Dardigan, Josh Doherty and Peter Bagnall, will be available to answer further detailed questions during and after this press conference. Based on our careful sampling, we estimate that when fully analysed, these logs will bring to public knowledge more than 15,000 previously unreported civilian deaths, to add to the 107,000 which are already in the Iraq body count database. 15,000 is a huge number. It's equivalent to five 9-11s, or nearly 300 seven sevens. However, the newly revealed deaths do not primarily come from large bombings like this. Most of the larger incidents were already well reported by the world's press and media. The new deaths are concentrated in small incidents, killing one or two people at a time, scattered all over Iraq and occurring almost every day for the whole period. Targeted assassinations, drive-by shootings, executions, checkpoint killings. These are the small but relentless tragedies of this war that these logs reveal in unprecedented detail. Adding in the combatant deaths reported in these logs and combining with other previously reported deaths, we are now able to say that more than 150,000 people have been killed in total since 2003, of which about 80% were civilians. Even where deaths were previously known about as numbers, these logs often turn numbers into human beings. For instance, the IBC database records that on November the 1st, 2006, 35 bodies were found around Baghdad that day, as reported, for example, by Reuters, the New York Times, CNN, among others. However, media reports did not identify any of the victims, nor give details of how each one died. So our IBC database has just this spare information in it. The Iraq war logs also report 35 bodies found that day, but spread across 27 logs specifying a wide range of details, including the precise neighbourhood and time of day where particular bodies were found, and in many cases, the demographics and identities of those killed. So when fully processed, the information in these logs will allow our single entry to be replaced by over 20 detailed incidents. 
Most surprisingly of all, we have found a huge number of names of victims meticulously recorded in these logs. It's unclear to us why the US Army wanted to go to such lengths in its recording, but it is of huge public importance and interest that it did. Names are the gold dust of casualty recording enterprise, and the only certain route to a full and final death toll that will satisfy all parties, including bereaved families. We've already found over 100 previously reported civilian victim names in the logs we've examined, and we estimate that many thousands more will be discovered as analysis proceeds. For instance, on 29th of November 2006, 28 bodies were discovered in a mass grave south of Bakaba. This was comprehensively reported by press and media at the time, but not a single one of those reports gave the names of a single victim. The Iraq war logs list all these names one by one, and so today, for the first time, they have been put into the public record nearly four years later. The unprecedented level of detail in these logs is important for another reason too. It's the main way in which we can properly assess what is new in them. The crude death totals that these logs provide are lower than the comparable count from IBC, also lower than figures from others providing totals, such as the Iraq Ministry for Human Rights. This can tempt people to mistakenly assert that there is nothing new in these logs. Our analysis shows how hugely mistaken that assertion is. In conclusion, we believe that having received these logs, WikiLeaks was right to publish them in this heavily redacted form. But the real story is not about the release itself, but the grave content of the logs themselves. Almost every log tells a story, and far too often, this is a previously unknown story of human suffering and death. It will take many months, even years, to extract every important fact from these logs. The Iraq Body Count is committed to playing its part in this fact-finding work, no matter how long it takes because there can be no closure or moving on from this or any war until every last victim has been properly recognized and the full details of the circumstances of their death acknowledged. These logs are potentially the largest sing single contribution to achieving that goal that has ever been published. We ask everyone, including the US government, to support this work, which is in the public interest and brings closer the proper recognition that all the victims of this tragic war deserve. <clears throat> Phil China. The question you're probably asking is, well, what now? And I'm going to tell you about some of the legal action that will follow here in the UK. And it'd be wrong to assume that as, as these are US logs, this has nothing to do with the UK. Public interest lawyers are presently acting for many Iraqi civilians who've been killed or tortured by UK forces. Some have been killed by indiscriminate attacks on civilians or the unjustified use of lethal force. Others have been killed in custody with UK forces. No one knows how many Iraqis lost their lives whilst held in British detention facilities. The most notable of those, of course, is Baha Musa, and we now await the inquiry's report into his death due in early 2011. The Iraq war logs add hugely to the evidence in the, in the public domain as to the effect of the invasion and subsequent occupation of Iraq by coalition forces, including the UK. What can be said about the logs comes under three headings. All three areas are, or will soon be, the subject of legal action here in the UK. The first is that of unlawful killings or civilians or indiscriminate attacks upon them, or the unjustified use of lethal force against them. It may never be known how many Iraqis died, but we now know from the important work of Iraq Body Count that the previously known number of deaths, 107,369, is likely to have increased by around a staggering 15,000. Some of these deaths will be in circumstances where the UK had a very clear legal responsibility. This may be because the Iraqis died whilst under the effective control of UK forces, under arrest in vehicles, <coughs> helicopters or detention facilities. These deaths will all fall within the jurisdiction of the European Convention on Human Rights if the judgment of the Grand Chamber in the Al-Skaini case, which is due early in 2011, asserts, as we expect, that once UK forces have authority and control over Iraqis, there is jurisdiction for the purposes of the European Convention. But others 
will not be covered by the European Convention on Human Rights. For example, public interest lawyers has a case where a UK tank stopped and in broad daylight a rifleman aimed, shot and killed an eight-year-old girl playing in her yellow dress in a Basra street. There are many other cases like that and the logs add to the number of cases that will not be within the jurisdiction of the European Convention. But we will argue in a case shortly that the common law here in the UK provides the same remedy as the European Convention, namely that there must now be a judicial inquiry into the legality of all of these deaths. If unjustified or unlawful force has been used, prosecutions of all those responsible must follow. So we're bringing forward a new case seeking accountability for all unlawful deaths and we argue that there must be a judicial inquiry to fully investigate UK responsibility for civilian deaths in Iraq. The second area is the huge number of logs that detail horrendous torture and abuse of Iraqis by either the Iraqi National Guard or the Iraqi Police Service. The US and the UK appear to have adopted a fragmented order that required them to take no action whatsoever once they'd established that this torture and ill treatment was the responsibility of Iraqis. Now this is completely contrary to international law. It's well known that there's an absolute prohibition on torture. It may never be used. Accordingly, all states owe a duty to each other to cooperate together to stamp it out and to deal with incidents of torture so that torturers know beforehand that they will be found out and they will be prosecuted for their war crimes. US and UK forces cannot turn a blind eye on the basis it wasn't their soldiers doing the torturing. And that's what's happened and is revealed in these logs. Both states have the clearest of international obligations to take definite and effective action to stop the torture by the Iraqis. That they did not makes them complicit. Pill is bringing forward a second case seeking accountability for the UK's failure to act in these circumstances. The third area concerns the huge and growing body of evidence about killings, ill treatment and torture of Iraqis whilst in UK custody. There appear to be many cases other than that of Bahamusa where Iraqis died in UK custody and were then certified as dying from natural causes. None of, these invest none of these deaths have been investigated. Many of these Iraqis were hooded and abused, and my law firm does not accept the Ministry of Defence's explanation that each and every one of these deaths has an innocent explanation. Additionally, there are hundreds of Iraqis now complaining of ill treatment and torture, often as a result of coercive interrogation techniques by UK interrogators within secret facilities run by the Joint Forward Interrogation Team. Insofar as the logs add to this body of evidence, they will help us gain a single inquiry into the UK's detention policy and practice in South East Iraq. A Court of Appeal and High Court judge sitting together will hear a case about all of these incidents on the 5th to the 9th of November 2010. Thanks very much. <coughs> We're going to open up very, very quickly now for questions from the audience, but we have a, a surprise sort of announcement, uh, an unusual announcement, because we have a, an unusual addition uh, to the speakers this morning. We have here in the front row probably the most famous whistleblower in modern American history, Daniel Ellsberg, author of the Pentagon Papers, and we'll hear from him shortly. Uh, I would request, though, in, during the questions, uh, that all the questioners uh, un to understand that the speakers are pleased to answer any and all questions concerning the release of the documents, the analysis of the data, and conclusions, and the work that's been done. Uh, but I think I'd like, if I may, just to open the questions by asking Daniel Elberg, Ellsberg, uh, what's your reaction to this kind of release of material? It's quite different than the one that you did yourself. Well, it's different and it's the same in many ways, just as the war that we're facing right now, the one in Afghanistan, which I call Vietnamistan, has really more fundamental similarities than it has differences. I've been asked here to make a couple of comments rather than questions to you right away. I'll just say that 
couple of us here came over the ocean last night for the opportunity to stand with Julian Assange and the rest of you here in uh, a circumstance that really I've been waiting to see for 40 years. And I, uh, that's a number is not drawn out of the air. That's a precise figure.